Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the webinar. We are in session number two of our clinical trial education series. This webinar is entitled, What is Involved in a Clinical Trial? Learn from the Experts. So today, before we get started, I just wanted to introduce you, if you don't know about Mended Hearts, to Mended Hearts. Our mission is to inspire hope and improve the quality of life of heart patients and their families through ongoing peer-to-peer -peer support, education, and advocacy. You can find us all over social media or at our website at mendedhearts.org or mendedlittlehearts.org. We also have a brand new website that specifically focuses on our getting a peer-to-peer -peer support visit from another heart cardiovascular patient, and that's across the lifespan. And you can reach us there at myheartvisit.org. Before we begin, I just want to give a couple of announcements. All attendees are in listen-only mode. If you cannot hear, hopefully you can see the slides and you can read to check the audio button on your personal computer to assure the sound is on. Please type your questions into the Q&A box at any time during the presentation. The moderator will read your question during the question and answer period. As a note, please note that the presenter will not be able to answer specific questions about you or your loved one as they are not the treating physician. physician. And then finally, the PDF version of the slides, as well as the recording of this presentation, will be available on the Mended Hearts website following the event. And now I would lo love to introduce to you our wonderful speaker for the day, Catherine Van Ziel. She is the Clinical Research Coordinator for the Structural Heart Program at Morristown Medical Center. So Catherine, thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate your time. And I am going to turn this over to you. Great, thank you. All right, so we are gonna to talk today about what is involved in a clinical trial. All right, so what is a clinical trial? Clinical trial are research studies that explore whether a medical strategy, treatment, or device is safe and effective for humans. These studies may also show which medical approaches work best for certain illnesses or groups of people. They can be conducted for medications and devices, and they assist in getting new medications and devices, FDA approval, or expand their existing indications. Clinical research is the only legitimate pathway for developing new, safe, and effective treatments for a medical disorder or condition. It evaluates or compares one or more therapeutic intervention, interventions for safety and potential benefits. Clinical trial phases. There are four phases to clinical trial. First is preclinical testing of drugs in non-human subjects to gather efficacy, toxicity, and pharmacokinetic information. Um, this is also a phase for device studies as well as drug studies. Phase one testing testing of drugs on healthy volunteers for dose ranging determines whether drug is safe to check for efficacy. And there's about 20 to 100 normal healthy volunteers or cancer patients if it's cancer drugs that they're studying. This is the point where we're looking to see, is it safe to use in people? Phase two or early feasibility determines whether the drug is safe for efficacy determines whether the drug can have any efficacy. And at this point, the drug is not pre, uh, predetermined to have any therapeutic effect whatsoever. About 100 to 300 patients with the specific disease that we're studying are involved in this. Oh, skipping ahead here. Phase three or pivotal is the testing of the drug on patients to assess efficacy, effectiveness, and safety, and it determines a drug's therapeutic effect. At this point, the drug is presumed to have some therapeutic effect, and about 300 to up to 3,000 patients with specific diseases are involved in this. This is the point uh, where um, patients will be randomized as well. We'll discuss that a little later, but they'll be assigned by chance to an arm. And then phase four is post-marketing surveillance. We're watching um, for the drug use in public. Uh, so after a drug has already been FDA approved, they're still studying it to look for long-term effects that maybe weren't showing up in the initial studies. 
who sponsors or conducts these trials? So the federal government can do it. Those are NIH sponsored trials or medical device and pharmaceutical companies. So as we all know now, um, Pfizer with the, with the COVID uh, vaccine studies, and then physicians that are interested in research. So smaller studies can be just conducted, um, you know, and maybe something for an allergy will be done at an allergist's office, just a private practice type of thing. So the balancing act of clinical research, we have the, on the one side, the scientific advancement, the pharmaceutical sponsors, the product development, the whole science of it. But then on the other side, we have to balance the regulatory oversight, the federal government's oversight and making sure that the human subject protection is there. How many new drugs make it to market? So only five in 5,000 drugs that enter preclinical testing. So that's the, the where we're not testing on humans, we're using animals for testing. Only five of 5,000 actually progress to human testing, which is phase one. One of these five drugs that are tested in people is eventually approved. And the chance, so the chance of making a new drug um, to market is about one in 5,000, so not very good odds. This is kind of a, a busy slide. It just kind of goes over the, what it costs per, per phase of trial, per different breakdowns, so respiratory, oncology, hematology. Um, but basically the average time of a trial is 12 years and the average cost over that 12 years is $1.2 billion. The most important thing in clinical research is the subject, is the patient, their health, their safety, and their overall welfare. So I'm a research coordinator and this is my, my basic job. So conducting the informed consent process, we'll go a little bit into informed consent in a bit, ensuring compliance with the protocol along with institutional and federal regulations. And the primary responsibility as with all clinical research pro professionals is the protection of human research subjects, making sure that the patients are protected. We also assist in determining feasibility of conducting the study at a site. Is, does, our, does the hospital have what the study needs to do? Do we have the proper x-rays, CAT scans, um, whatever else? Preparing the IRB submission and other regulatory responsibilities, writing the informed consent document, developing the cost analysis, negotiating the budget with the sponsor. So we, we need to get down to the nitty gritty like we're, making sure that we're reimbursed for all of our work that we're doing for the companies. Um, subject recruitment, patient care, adverse event reporting, all sorts of um, meetings, monitor visits, pl plenty to do. An IRB, Institutional Review Board, is an administrative body established to protect the rights and welfare of human research subjects recruited to participate in research activities conducted under the auspices of the institution for which it is affiliated. All research involving human subjects must be approved by an IRB. And each IRB has requirements for protocol submissions. They usually include application and an informed consent at a minimum. A study cannot begin at a site unless it has an IRB approval. Just a couple of cute little pictures and we always, we all remember Lucy and uh, clinical research patients are lab rats, false, they're medical heroes, so thank you. The historical conduct, the historic perspective of the unethical conduct on human research. So in 1927, the FDA was created. And in 1937, Elixir of sulfalamide caused over a hundred deaths in 1937. So this elixir was used for a variety of ailments. There was no regulations and animal testing was not required. So back then they just said, hey, let's just try this. And unfortunately this did not turn out well. As a result in 1938, the US Food, Drug and Cosmetic Act, which was pre-market review of new drugs, manufacturing of inspections and FDA enforcement powers. So it was the beginning of, of the FDA kind of monitoring what, what um, people were trying to give for certain things. Um, in the 1960s, the thalidomide disaster. So this was a drug that was given to pregnant women that ended up causing great 
physical um, harm to the fetus. These, these women were told that this was gonna be used for nausea and morning sickness, and um, the, the results were catastrophic for, for their babies. Then in 1962, they introduced a requirement for drug manufacturers to provide proof of the effectiveness and safety of their drugs before approval. So this would kind of be along with those the, the phases of the trial that we discussed earlier. The Tuskegee experiment made news in 1972. Minority men were in a study of the natural course of syphilis and they were not informed when a treatment for it, syphilis was discovered. So basically they, it violated basic bioethical principles. From 1932 to 72, the study was, was going on. The purpose of the study was to actually observe the natural history of untreated syphilis. They were told it would be about six months long and it took about 40 years to, to do. These men were told that they were getting treated but it was actually placebo. And despite the fact that in 1947, um, penicillin was now widely available and used for treatment of syphilis, they continued to not treat these men so that they could see just what happened to them. So the Belmont Report. On July 12, 1974, the National Research Act was signed into law, thus creating the National Commission for the Protection of Human Subjects of Biomedical and Behavioral Research. One of the charges to the commission was to identify the basic ethical principles that should underlie the conduct of biomedical and behavioral research involving human subjects and to develop guidelines which should be followed to assure that such research is conducted in accordance with those principles. The Belmont Report identifies respect for persons, benevolence, and justice as ethical principles which must underlie the human subject research. This is how all research is run today. The bottom line is we are protecting the patients. We're, we're here for the patients and not for, not for necessarily just the science. The Declaration of Helensky is a set of ethical principles regarding human experimentation that was developed for the medical community by the World Medical Association, the WMA. It's widely regarded as the cornerstone document on human research ethics. The fundamental principle is respect for the individual, the right to self-determination, and the right to make informed decisions regarding participation in research. And this is where the informed consent is coming in, the informed decisions. The investigator's duty is to solely the patient or the volunteer. And while there's always a need for research, the subject's welfare was, must always take precedence over the interests of science and society. Ethical considerations must always take precedence over laws and regulations. So research should be based on thorough knowledge of scientific background and a careful assessment of the risks and the benefits. It must have a reasonable likelihood of benefit to the population studied, it must be conducted by suitably trained investigators. So if you're doing um, a cardiac study, it has to be run by a cardiologist. If you're doing a dermatology study, it has to be run by a dermatologist. You must use FDA um, approved protocol. So the FDA is not just approving the therapy that we're, that we're studying, they must also approve the protocol that the study is going to be run by. Um, and you must be subject to independent ethical review and oversight by a properly convened committee. And this happens throughout the entire duration of the study. These committees are reviewing to make sure that everything is going along as it should be. So the Nuremberg Code it's a set of research ethics, um, ethic principles for human experimentation that was created as a result of the Nuremberg trials at the end of the Second World War. It's a 10 point statement meant to prevent future abuse of human subjects. And it states that above all participation in research must be voluntary. Um, this was designed to protect human subjects from enduring the kind of cruelty and exploitation that the prisoners endured at the concentration camps. These, these prisoners were, were, they were not asked to participate in some of these horrible studies that they, that they did, they were, they were forced to. The results of research, this is all part of the Nuremberg Code, the results of research must be useful and unobtainable by any other means. It must be rationally based on knowledge of the disease or the condition studied. It must avoid unnecessary suffering the study cannot include death or disabling injury as a foreseeable consequence. Its benefits must outweigh its risks. 
the study must use proper facilities to protect participants. It must be conducted by qualified individuals. Participants may withdraw from the study if they wish. And investigators must be prepared to stop the study should participants die or become disabled as a result of participation. So why should I participate in a clinical trial? Clinical trials are necessary. They allow the FDA to determine if a treatment is safe, effective, and should be available to the public. Interim data is submitted to the FDA throughout the duration of the trial. It's not just that they study something for several years and then submit all the data to the FDA. During the entire, um, the entire duration of the trial, we are constantly submitting interim data to them so that they can evaluate and they can they can decide this isn't this isn't going as it was, was supposed to we're going to stop this trial or carry on the way you're going clinical trials give you access to new treatments and they may give you access to cutting edge treatment options so for just right here in our center mm -hmm. um, about oh gosh i guess like eight to ten years ago we started a study for aortic stenosis about 10 years ago, your, your only option was open heart surgery. And then we started the clinical trials for the TAVRs, the transcatheter aortic valve replacements. These were initially all clinical trial related. Um, and these were randomized studies that patients either got the new TAVR or open heart surgery. And years later, the TAVR is the gold standard for aortic valve replacement. And very few people now get open heart surgery for that. Patients are in and out in a day versus five to 10 days with open heart surgery. So this is all because of, of clinical research. We've now moved on to the, the other valves in the heart. So now we're doing clinical tri trials for transcatheter for the tricuspid and the mitral valves as well. And one day those will be the gold standards as well. So clinical trials need participants also from all backgrounds. Some conditions are more prevalent than, other, than others in certain populations. So it's very important that we have a, a mixed variety of male, female, different um, cultures, um, every, everything needs to be represented within research. How do I know if I am eligible for a trial? So your doctor will give you an informed consent to read. This provides you all the information that you need to know about the trial. You must sign this before any research related testing is done. It's not a contract. It does not mean that you have to, to move on to do it. Um, you may withdraw at any time. And within the, within the informed consent, all the risks, the benefits and the alternative treatments are all, also must be listed. You need to know that you don't have to participate in this, that A, B and C are your other options. Um, inclusion, exclusion, they're factors that make patients eligible or ineligible for a study. So examples of inclusion could be um, patient must be between 10 and 85 years of age. They must have X disease and it has to be this severe. And then for exclusion, it could also be age. They, they're 86, they're excluded. Um, they're too severe, maybe they only want moderately severe of a particular disease and you're too severe, so you're excluded. Or if you have other coexisting medical conditions that they could exclude you. Um, depending on the study and inclusion exclusion could be five to 10 points or 30 to 40 points. Uh, screening and baseline testing, these are activities that are performed to ensure that participants are qualified for the study. So usually after you've signed your informed consent, you'll go ahead and do all the screening and baseline testing um, to make sure that you still fall within the, the parameters of um, being eligible. And then um, oftentimes studies have screening committees. So after all of the testing is done, everything's put together in a package and it's sent to a screening committee and they're usually a non-biased um, group that's not involved with either the hospital or, or the, um, the company that's sponsoring the trial and they determine the final eligibility because they wanna make sure that they're getting the right people in these studies. So research terms, randomization. Randomiz randomization is, is a, that treatments are assigned by chance and not choice. They're usually computer generated 
And depending on the study, it could either be your randomized one-to-one -one or two-to-one. Um, different examples of randomization would be, so, so if you're in a drug trial, it could be randomized to what they're studying versus a placebo, or um, to go back to the TAVERS, they were randomized to either open heart surgery, which was at the time the current gold standard to the transcatheter or the TAVR. So you were randomized to one of those. It's computer generated. It's not that anyone is picking or choosing for, for you. Um, we, we don't ever have a, have a choice with that when we're running the studies. So blinded studies are designed to prevent members of the research team and study participants for influencing the results of the trial. So there are different kinds of blind. There could be double blinded where neither the researcher or the patient knows what they got. Um, uh, you could do that with drug studies and the, the pharmacist who's dispensing would know, but neither the doctor nor the patient would know. And they just don't want, they don't want it, they don't want like the, the placebo effect or the not placebo effect to be happening. So they'll blind those. Um, blinded studies obviously can't happen with surgical or device procedures very often. Um, placebo is an inactive product that resembles the test product. So the placebo is what they might randomize you to if you're in a drug study. So risks versus benefits. Clinical trials may, may involve risk, but so can routine medical care. And oftentimes when people read through the informed consent and they're reading the risks, they get, they get very frightened um, to read all of these things. But you know, routine medical care ha has oftentimes equally as many risks. They just have to be disclosed when you're involved in a clinical trial. All, all risks must be disclosed, no matter how, how big or small. These risks, like I said, are described in the informed consent and oftentimes it could be two pages worth of risks. Um, time involved for research versus standard of care. If you are doing going the standard of care, so the non-research route, you could just have, say you're, say you're having um, a device implanted. Say you're, say you're having a pacemaker and you're, you're going for the FDA approved one versus one that might be involved in a study or research. If you get the FDA approved one, you go for your procedure, you come for a follow-up and you're done. For research, you're gonna have to be following up for up to um, five years potentially. So some of our studies are up to 10 years. They tend to be more involved in the beginning. So the first year of a research study could be, you have to come at 30 days, at three months, at six months, at a year, sometimes even 18 months, but then it goes to every year. So you'll go you know, from one year to two year, three year, four year, and so on. So before you sign up for your research, you need to make sure that you're, you're willing to, to put the time in that's needed. Um, you're, you're, it's not only are you potentially helping yourself, but you're helping others. Maybe we're gonna find an answer to something that's gonna help others and just help science. And you could gain access to cutting edge therapy, again, to go back to the TAVRs, like these people that were randomized to TAVR, they, this, was, this was just out of this world, like to have, be able to get something like this versus open heart surgery. Um, and then research participants have extra care. It, it, studies do show that people who are involved in research tend to do better because of all the extra eyes on them. You have extra testing that wouldn't be done otherwise, extra visits, extra eyes on you. The research nurses are all over your care. So, so you, they, they just tend to do better with all that extra care. What else do I need to know? So you always wanna know about insurance and cost. And this is also gonna be discussed in the informed consent. Um, oftentimes, if you're a Medicare patient, Medicare will cover most research. Um, so they'll, they'll cover it just as they would cover any standard of care treatment. Um, if not, uh, we need, we, this is something we need to look into before, before you move forward. If you have private insurance, we'll always call the insurance company to see, does the patient have research benefits? If they don't have research benefits, they either can't be involved in the trial or we can try appealing to the insurance company to see if they would cover the cost of, the, of not only the device or the drug, but the follow-up that would be involved as well. You always wanna know how long will the study last? Is it gonna be just a year? Is it five years? Is it 10 years? And even that can change. We had one study that was a five-year study and they realized when they got to about four years that they wanted to study it longer. So they expanded it to 10 years and we just reconsented patients that were agreeable to come back for the 10 years. 
um, how many visits are involved. If you're still working full time and you have a lot of visits to come for research for the first year, this might not be something that is going to work for you because those visits are very important. They need to get this data in for uh, to have the, the right information to be submitting to the FDA. And withdrawing from research. You can always withdraw from research that, like we said earlier, this isn't a contract. You're not bound to it, but it's it's really something that we we try to encourage people not to do. Um, it could skew the data, having people pull out, especially when it's randomized, because now you don't have the proper balance of the randomized arms. So always an option, but definitely not something that, that is encouraged. So closing thoughts. Again, participating in clinical trials is always voluntary. It is never something that should be forced on you. It is your decision. It's an informed decision. Um, and your, your doctor is always there to answer questions and guide you, but it's, it's up to the patient if they wanna be involved or not. You can quit a clinical trial at any time despite having in, signed the informed consent document, but again, encourage not to, but the bottom line is the patient can leave if they want to. And your personal rights and data are always protected. So when we're submitting stuff, um, to the insurance, I mean, to the to the sponsors of the trial, we never we never send in names and dates of birth. Everything is done by patient number, so identifiers, um, and not names or anything. And all the if we're sending reports in, all of the data is blacked out, and your your um your patient number is put on there, your study number. And that is all I have. Great, thank you so much. I appreciate it. It was great information. Um, before we get to questions from the audience, because we do have a bunch, there were a couple of questions that um, I had that had come in to me regarding clinical trials as we were preparing the education program. So I just wanted to ask those now, and then we'll get to the audience questions. Um, one is I did have someone um, ask about concern. Uh, questions concerning insurance and how devices aren't typically covered by private insurance companies. Mm -hmm. I find that that's relatively um, common or is that not something that we commonly see when we're looking at device trials? So it depends on the insurance. Medicare, um, we usually have Medicare agreements with, it's actually something that's usually set up all the time is um, a CMS agreement so that the Medicare approves this study so they'll approve the device and all the follow-up, um, just as they would um, do any kind of standard of care. So it'd be the 80-20, and then if you have a secondary, they usually follow along with what, what Medicare decided. The private insurances are different. Some of them will follow along with what Medicare does, but a lot of them like will have to, we, we lose quite a few patients that are younger that don't have Medicare or private insurance. Um, we'll call up and we'll ask the, the um, the insurance company, do they have clinical research benefits? This is all the always the question we have to ask, do you have clinical research benefits? Unfortunately too, most, I would say 80% of the time we make that phone call, the person on the other line is like, I need a code, what are you talking about? They don't even know what the question is. Um, so it's getting to the right person to even find out if they have clinical trial benefits. Sometimes they'll just give us a flat no, and sometimes they'll say, we need, we need some more information and um, we, you, can appeal the, you can appeal the decision. Oftentimes it's harder to appeal if there is something commercially available. Um, I think it's a little easier to appeal if there's nothing, if there's nothing available. Great, um, that's good information and good knowledge to know. Um, the second question is surrounding randomization uh, and I guess receiving a placebo versus receiving the treatment. Um, can you explain that patients are not literally given no treatment versus this clinical trial treatment, right? That there, there is a standard of care that they must receive. Um, Depends. So, so some, some, I think sometimes there can be placebos. We, we specifically do device here. So um, it's been a long, long time since I've done a drug study, um, but there can be placebos 
Um, but I think most of the time, even the drugs are randomized to whatever the standard of care um, is is available. Yeah, I, I mean, there would never they would never put a placebo for something that obviously you needed. I mean, if it was if you're studying a blood thinner, they're not going to give you a, a placebo. They'll give you another. It'll be randomized to another blood thinner. Okay. Yeah, I think that was the question and the concern from the person who asked the yeah. question. Like, yeah. So am I just going to not get any treatment or right. yeah. is my chance on getting the treatment? So I think that that answers that mm -hmm. question. Mandy, would you like to go ahead and ask questions from the audience? Sure. So the first question is a multi-part question. How do you find out if there is a trial in your area? And is your cardiologist ethically obliged to make you aware of the trials? Um, or if there is an alternate option or a new innovation available being offered outside of their center or their hospital? So um, the car specific just cardiologist, just your regular cardiologist may not be aware of what kind of clinical trials are available for different things. Where, where, you'll, where you'll find out where there's trials is, so for example, I work on all the all the mitral studies here, the mitral valve studies at Morristown. When someone has a murmur and they go on to have an echo and they find out that they have something wrong with their mitral valve, they're then referred to the valve center. So your regular cardiologist wouldn't be taking care of this. They'd send you off. Once you get to our valve center, that's where our physicians will say, okay, we have clinical trials here. And we actually have quite a few for, for each disorder. So, you know, I often go into a patient's room and give them three consents at a time and say, read through these. And it's not necessarily even which they might choose. All of them are a little bit different. And after we do more testing, we might say, okay, even though you read all of them, the second one is the one that is, is best for you. So your regular cardiologist might not know about studies. It's once you get to the, the specialist that, that they become more aware. There's also a website, it's called clintrials.gov, C-L-I-N-T-R-I-A-L-S.gov. And that, um, that lists every single trial that's available in, I guess, in the entire country. And it breaks it down by center. And it will even like, it will even have on there that I'm the coordinator for a particular trial and what my contact information is. Thank you. Do you, I think you covered this when you were talking about the um, the money, but do you have to pay to participate in a trial or are there stipends to offset um, any costs out of pocket or the transportation costs as well? So you usually for us, I, I think that's the stipends are different center to center, but for us, we usually offer um, about a $50 stipend for each visit just to cover the cost of gas, um, tolls, parking at the hospital, things like that. So um, usually, again, this is just specific to us, but we do about a $50 per visit. Do you know ever, are there trials out there that participants have to pay to be in? Or pay are they to be in? No. That yeah. never happens. You shouldn't have to pay to be in one, yeah. Um, I guess the, uh, the question is, I'd be curious to learn what is involved or expected of me for the first study visit when I can sign a consent form. So can you describe what a typical screening visit's like for a device clinical trial? Sure. So you'll usually see the physician. Uh, for the most part, they've already had imaging done, usually um, at least a, a transthoracic echo. So they identified what the problem is. Um, the doctor will call me down. He'll say, okay, I have so-and-so um, here with mitral regurgitation. Can you bring down a consent for and whichever one he wants me to bring down? At that point, that, at that point because these consents are often about 20 pages long, we don't like just saying, oh, here, sign here and let's get started. We ask patients to take it home, read through it, write down any questions that they have. And this is all part of of what it is, it's an informed consent. And so you need to read this so that you are informed before you're moving forward. And we always ask patients, we don't want your wife and your daughter to read it. We want you, I mean, your wife and your daughter can read it, but we need to make sure that you've read it too. Like, we just don't want your wife coming in and saying, I read it, sign them up. The patient himself or herself needs to be aware and um, understand everything that's involved. So we'll often send them home read the consent, knowing that we still have more testing to do. And so we'll say, 
the day that you come back for your further testing, I'll sit with you and we'll go through your questions and we'll decide if you do in fact want to move forward. At that point, when patients come back, they can sign the consent and um, we always give a copy of the signed consent back to the patient so they have for their own records. And then after the consent is signed, that's when we can move forward with any study related procedures. So any further testing that might be needed. So um, maybe a transesophageal echocardiogram, you might need a cardiac cath, you might need um, a CAT scan. Um, different studies require different types of testing um, for screening. Then there's all um, other different testing. Um, we might perform different neurological exams on you because we want, we want a pre and a post. So we wanna see what your baseline neuro status is before you get the device versus after. So basically everything that we, for almost everything that we do at the screening baseline, we're gonna do a follow-up visits as well. So um, if, you need a, if you need the neuro testing, if you need a six minute walk, if you need blood work, if you need, you need quality of life questionnaires, that's a big one. We always do quality of life questionnaires with patients because they're looking to see, did the patient's quality of life improve after they had the device implanted? So um, whatever you had done in the screening baseline um, visit is often mirrored in follow-up visits after you're treated. Awesome, that's very thorough, thank you. Are there telehealth trials for the follow-up? So that even those who um, don't drive or they're homebound that they could still participate? Um, so during COVID, we did a lot of telehealth just obviously because of COVID, but um, that often can't work because most of, so in drug studies, it might, it might be able to work, but in device studies, um, Almost every visit that you come back for, we need a repeat echocardiogram, EKG, blood work. So the the telehealth visits aren't. Um, you know, we can get some information, but we really need we really need some of that more clinical data as well. Thank you. Could you describe what's involved in the follow up to the procedure for the length of the study? I guess you sort of did that in your last question when you talked about it's identical to what happens in the yeah first. yeah because they want to compare and see how how you're doing is that on, true on the... oh i'm so sorry that's okay i just wondered about studies that you're talking about that are really long term like years and years are you still so, doing... like some of us some of ours are 10 years long and no some of those more detailed things will only do for maybe the first two or three years and then the 10 year would um i i most of them do still always do the quality of life questionnaires right to the end um, to the tenure, but but otherwise, a lot of the other things like the walk and the neuro testing and all that that usually stops around two years because if if you know if if you didn't have a neuro event from from being treated up to two years after, you're likely it's not going to be related to the device after. Um, but the echocardiograms and things like that, they will carry those out through ten years. Oftentimes, though, the ten year studies once it gets to like six and seven years they'll skip a year. So it might be six years, then skip seven years, and maybe seven years, only a phone call. Like, hey, you doing okay? Were you hospitalized? Did anything happen in the last year? And then the following year, again, will be an inpatient, in-person visit. And then maybe year nine is another phone follow-up and 10 would be back in. So it's not, it's not even, you could go two years without having to physically come to the center for a visit, but you'll just do phone follow-ups. Thank you. Are the drug and device companies identified in the studies? Always, yeah. Mm -hmm. it, and it's always right in the in the informed consent. It'll it'll let you know what what company is sponsoring it and what doctor in the hospital is is overseeing it. Okay. Uh, what if the valve center you're referred to by your cardiologist doesn't offer trials? Are they obliged to make you aware of options beyond what they can offer you? Or um, does a patient have to discover that on their own and, you know, sort of be their own advocate? They should be told. Um, even for us, we're, we're such a big valve center, but there, we, you can't do every single clinical trial that's out there. So if we've, you know, we, there, there's, there's often a very high um, screen fail rate for some of these device trials that inclusion exclusion that we spoke to earlier, like a lot of people can be excluded to the, uh, from, the, from the studies from those things. So even we will say, okay, we've exhausted all of our resources here, but 
Um, Columbia has a study that we don't do. We can give you the name of a physician there and you could make an appointment to go there. So they should be sending you somewhere where there are, where there are other options. Okay. And, and you know, you, you can know, you know, if anyone on this call now knows, okay, there's such a thing as device clinical research trials. It's something that you could say to your phys physician, are there any, are there any research trials that I should know about? I don't know if you can answer this since it's about drug studies, but will the drug be sent to a participant's home or do they always have to travel to the site or the facility to get them? From, from my recollection, from when I did do it, they do like you to come in because it's part of the, it's called drug, it's the drug accountability. So we want you to bring your pill bottle back with you. We're going to count the pills because we know how many should be in there. And if there's too many or, or too little, then we know that you did something wrong. So we can try to like remedy what, how you're taking them at home. And then you need to, and then we, every, every hospital that does research has a research pharmacy. It's not just the regular pharmacy in the hospital. So then we have to bring down that, that um, vial of, of pills with whatever's left in them and exchange them for the new one with the pharmacy. So I'm not sure hundred percent if things have changed, but back when I did do drug study, you did have to come in and do the, do the exchange okay. in person. Thank you. I think the next question is about telehealth, which you've already asked. Um, Bonnie, I don't understand. Bonnie asked, why is a six minute walk done? I'm not quite sure what that. So a six minute walk is, it's a cardiac test. So it's basically, we set up um, two chairs a hundred feet apart in, in um, a not so busy hall in the hospital. And we set a timer for six minutes. We take a patient's blood pressure um, and pulse beforehand and their pulse ox. And we ask them beforehand, how short of, we give them a scale, how short of breath do you feel right now before you start walking? They walk for six minutes. They're, the reason we put the chairs there is if they get tired, um, if their knee hurts, any reason at all that they can stop at any point during the test and take a break. And we ask them, once you feel well enough, start going again. And we're looking to see how far you can walk in six minutes and how short a breath do you get after that six minutes. And that's another one of those pre and post tests that we'll do. So we're expecting if a person gets a new valve that they're gonna not walk that far, probably have to stop a few times and be quite short of breath after the test before they get their new valve versus after. We expect like a, a big um, improvement in the six minute walk after. And that's one of their, it's called, it's called an endpoint in a research trial. Um, every study has to have endpoints. There's primary and secondary endpoints. And oftentimes in cardiac studies, that six minute walk is actually an end. Most, most of the time it's a secondary endpoint, but it is an endpoint. They're looking to see, look at, look at how drastically different their, their six minute walk was before and after treatment. Makes sense. If you participate, does the hospital or the company provide updates on the results? And is that mandatory or is that something that's voluntary that they share with patients? They're, they don't usually um, provide results until after the study is over. Like sometimes we might get information on how, how things are going, but um, it's not usually something that's resulted until, until after. So this is a personal question more. It sounds like your job is very interesting. Actually, it really does. What's your favorite or the most rewarding part of what you do? The patients. I love, um, I don't know if, I don't know if Dorothy's on the call, but one of my patients was going to get on, on this call. Um, I love, I love seeing them from the beginning when they're not feeling too well to the amazing improvement after. And I love that relationship that we have for five to 10 years. And um, oftentimes the, the, it's, you, you develop friendships because like, like I said, in one of my slides, you get such extra care when you're involved in research. There's so many different um, reasons to, to be checked and testing. And, you know, part, part of, part of what we have to submit to the FDA is something called adverse events. So every time a patient's hospitalized or something happens to them, we need to collect that data. So if they were hospitalized somewhere else, we need to get all those records and we have to comb through all the records and we have to pull out whatever data the FDA wants and submit that to them. 
And so all the talking that you do with these patients, you just really develop a great relationship. So my, 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 my favorite is the patients. I, I'm not sure if you can answer this, it's specifically about heart failure, but are there specific hospital groups that you might know of that uh, have more heart failure clinical trials than say yeah, others? We have, um, we, we have here at Morristown, um, it's called the, so it's heart failure, but we call it the heart success program. Um, and that, that they have quite a few uh, clinical trials for, for heart failure. Um, some are device, some are, um, some are drug, but yeah, so, and, and again, all, a lot of, a lot of information can be found on, found on that clintrials.gov. Okay. This, Bonnie had mentioned that there's a good relationship developed with the staff running the trial and that she really enjoyed their personal friendliness during the trial that she was in. So they must enjoy that relationship yeah. as well. Good. What advice would you give to a patient that is considering participating in a device clinical trial? To ask questions, definitely to ask questions. I, you know, patients come in, like I said, when they come for that first visit, I give them the consent and I tell them go home and read it. Um, and I tell them to use that consent. I always say, this won't be the one you're signing. So feel free to write questions, comments anywhere. And then I like, I like when patients come in and they sit and they flip page by page and say, okay, I have a question about this part um, because it truly shows me that you are informed, that you did read it, that you know what to expect, what's gonna happen versus the people who come back and say, no, I have no questions. So ask, ask, ask questions and be, be your own advocate. Can you do a TAVR if you have mitral disease? You can, yep. Mm -hmm. Actually, a, a lot of our a lot of our mitral patients, um, because TAVR is now um, FDA approved, so a lot of patients have both aortic and mitral disease, and they'll get their TAVR, and then um, usually have to wait about a month after, and then we can work them up to enroll them in a in the mitral research trial. Thank you. Um, I don't know if, if Leslie or Jody can type the site, but Bonnie asks if you can repeat the name of the site that you just mentioned again yep. to look for trials, and then maybe we can type it in the chat box. Yeah, it's Morristown Medical Center in Morristown, New Jersey. But um, you also mentioned the site for people to find. Oh, oh, the site, the website. Oh, okay. Clin, yeah. C-L-I-N, trials, so clintrials.gov. Thank you. Um, just uh, this is a scenario that someone brought up. I have severe aortic stenosis, but my doctor is just monitoring me because I don't seem to have symptoms. I'm nervous to wait and would prefer to have my valve fixed. Is this okay to wait until symptoms are obvious? It doesn't seem logical. You can wait. That really actually is the standard of care, but there is actually also a clinical trial that uh, I think a lot of centers are doing. We're doing it. It's called the early trial, E-A-R-L-Y, E-A-R-L-Y, and that trial is looking to study, because right now you have to have symptoms in order to be treated for your aortic stenosis. This study is looking to see, does it benefit patients to be treated with severe aortic stenosis before they actually have any symptoms? That's a randomized trial. So you're either randomized to get a TAVR or what we call watchful waiting, but that watchful waiting, you're still involved in a trial, they're, they're keeping a closer eye on you. And then the second that you do develop symptoms, you move, you move on and you get treated. Thanks. And Dorothy says that, of course I'm here. I feel as strongly about our relationship as you do. Uh <laughs> <laughs> Sounds sweet. Uh, we've got two more questions left. I think we've got enough time for those. If a study is planned to last only a certain amount of time, like five years, would the participants still be monitored beyond that time? Good question. Not with the research center, but certainly with your own cardiologist. And finally, the language is confusing and scary for many medical forms. I say, yes, it is. <laughs> Do they seek patient input when designing the trial materials? Great question. Um, Sure, they do. I'm, I don't. I don't. I don't work on the on that the sponsor side, so I'm not sure how they 
how they um, do that, but I, I would I would imagine at some point they've had some sort of patient input. But yeah, they are they are very scary. But it's just everything has to, and we 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 tell the patients all the time, like if you all of this stuff is disclosed because it's it's a clinical trial. If you ever open the pamphlet to a bottle of Advil and read everything that was in there, you'd never take another Advil as long as you lived. <laughs> So um, no matter what you read, things that are FDA approved or are still in research, it, it, it can be scary. Thank you. So Andrew, I think that's all the questions we've got. That's great, thank you so much. And Catherine, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. Uh, I want to update everyone to mark your calendar for next Thursday at three o'clock. Um, we have webinar number three in the, clin in the clinical trial series. And this one, Megan Kolaray, um will be speaking to us about, is a clinical trial right for you? And she's gonna take a real deep dive into shared decision-making and informed consent. So we'll be talking really in detail about how to make those decisions effectively for yourself. Um, so that is next Thursday at 3 p.m. Um, you can register on our website, on our homepage, on the left-hand side, you'll see our clinical trials leading the way webpage. You can click there and register for the last two uh, because then the final one will be a patient panel um, discussing their journey in clinical trials. So thank you all for joining us. And um, thank you again, Catherine, for spending the last hour with us. You're welcome. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Take care.